Hello dear student, let's continue with transform part 2. We have reviewed important topics in transform part 1. Set this welcome and let's begin. Anticipatory healthcare. However, the real challenge in healthcare cuts deeper than the nature of our medical tools and healing procedures or the structure of our healthcare insurance system. It has to do with our thinking. At its root, the crisis in healthcare is the same as that in the energy industry, auto industry, or recording industry. We are barreling into the future with our eyes glued to the rear view mirror. The crisis in healthcare is not really a problem of cost. The system's cost is only a symptom of the disease, not the disease itself. In the ongoing national conversation about healthcare, just as with the national conversation around energy, we continue to ask the wrong question. And if you ask, start by asking the wrong question, the most you can hope for is really good wrong answers. The debate on healthcare typically centers around the question, who's going to pay for it? The question we need to be asking is not who's going to pay for it, but pay for what? The answer in a word is anticipation. We need an anticipatory approach to healthcare that prevents as many health problems as possible before they happen. Our present approach to healthcare is break fix model. You come into a hospital broken and we fix you. Well consider this, 95% of the money spent on a person's healthcare is spent in his or her last 5 years of life. As 78 million baby boomers enter the 70s, 80s, that model will collapse unless we shift it first. For example, five years ago, an uncle of mine who was in his 70s had a medical surgery. There was no room for him in the area hospitals, so they placed him in an hospice for a while. As it turned out, he badly needed surgery, but it took them days to realize it. Because he wasn't under observation in a hospital, and that's my uncle's generation. What is going to be like when the boomers hit that age bracket? And they are hitting it now when we are talking. The conventional allopathic break fix model is health curse petroleum. We watch its costs rising through the roof and try to figure out how we can pay for it. But the answer is that we can't pay for it. Nobody can. We have to change that it. Look what is happening with all the meds shortage around all Mexico healthcare's social security services. The beauty of Ben Gurki's cancer detecting capsule is that it solves a major problem through early detection, that is prevention. We need to treat as many of our health problems as possible before we have them, not afterward. You can only prevent something when you see it coming. In other words, what we need to be paying for is medical foresight. We need to apply flash foresight to our healthcare with anticipation and prevention. Of course. Many have been talking about prevention for years and there has already been a fundamental shift in public consciousness toward the concept of wellness. However, up to this point, wellness has developed as an alternative to the mainstream healthcare. That's going to have to change. Today wellness is something people opt for. Tomorrow it will no longer be a luxury, it will be a core strategy. In the past, we simply couldn't do this because we didn't have enough accurate information about what health problems 
lay on the road ahead for us, each of us. Now that we have mapped the human genome and are making constant and significant refinements to that knowledge, this is no longer the case. The hard trends tell us we are about to have a vastly greater capacity to project and predict health and disease tendencies, and that is, capacity will continue to grow at ever increasing rates. This will transform not only the healthcare system, but also the life insurance industry. Right now, we're using actuarial tables that are based on generalizations extract extracted from history. In other words, your insurance rates are set by a rear view mirror approach. Life insurance is an educated gamble. For example, your rates are affected by whether you smoke, but some people smoke throughout their lives and never get cancer, while others smoke and die of lung cancer in their 40s. What's the difference? Genetics. There are people who can take a drink and not become addicted, and others could take a drink and become alcoholics. The difference? Genetics and also our environment, our way of life, the people with which we surround ourselves with. If we have genetics predisposition, that we surround ourselves with healthy people who like to eat well, who like to play sports, who like to have their health in order, we will also have it that way. What if there were a simple blood test that could tell me which disease susceptibilities I've inherited and which I haven't? There is. Right now there are at least two companies that will provide exactly that service for you for $1,000. They'll even throw in a lineage search and find out where your ancestors came from. And that's just entering the foothills of the medical knowledge. We will soon be scholarly. In January 2008, a retired biotech entrepreneur named Dan Stoichescu slapped down 350000 and became the first paying customer of a Cambridge-based company called Gnome. Gnome service to deliver the fully parsed sequence of the roughly 6 billion chemical units of Stoichescu's entire genetic code. Stoichescu was not the first person to buy his complete genetic printout. That distinction belongs to James Watson, co-discoverer co of DNA, whose genome was sequenced that year before a company that donated 1.4 million in costs to demonstrate its technology. Note that sequence of costs from 1.5 million to 350,000 in less than a year. It's easy to predict that the price will go from hundreds of thousands to a few thousands to a few hundred, and eventually to nothing. The cost of petroleum may be on the rise, but the cost of information is plummeting ever downward towards zero. Now, instead of betting on my debt, my life insurance agent, will have the tools to serve as a lifestyle counselor. He will become a life insurance agent, helping to ensure my long, healthy life. When I am alive, I pay. When I die, they pay. They want me to stay alive. Accenture has already developed a technology that puts a face on this issue, yours. Stepping up to a kiosk outfitted with a video screen and a keyboard for input. You answer a short series of lifestyle questions. And this can be also done now in a web page or app. Questions about diet, exercise, whether you smoke, and so forth. And a video display responds by showing you exactly what you're looking to look like 20 years from now. Change the answers to any one question and you can see the positive or negative impact on the 20 year from now you. If you answer yes to do you smoke, 
then you'll see a lot more wrinkles and possibly a grayish pallor staring back at you. Change your answer to no and you will see stunned at the difference it makes in your complexion and overall facial vitality. It's a vivid display of the visible future and it packs a powerful emotional wallop. The biggest barrier to adopting healthier lifestyle habits is that the future is out of sight, out of mind. Sure, we know on some abstract intellectual level that smoking and eating junk are all going to take their toll, but on the abstract level is where it stays. Until you take a look of, at yourself in the Accenture kiosk. Of course, people can step on a scale and see that they are obese and already at risk. But that doesn't show them the visible future, it only shows them the visible present. We need to see the future consequence of today's choices. Self-health A shift from emergency remediation to technologically assist prevention will have enormous consequence on the shape of healthcare because it shifts the emphasis from practitioner to patient. One of the biggest challenges in healthcare, as in every other industry, is that we are losing practitioners. Our doctors and nurses are retiring in droves. With 78 million baby boomers heading toward their 70s, we're losing our hospital staff. But note, there's a hard trend at work here, and also a soft trend. Aging boomers will have increasing medical needs, that's a hard trend. But losing a large number of our doctors and nurses is a soft trend. It's possible, and given current conditions, even likely, but not inevitable. With flash foresight, that's a future we can change. If we had drastically fewer practitioners who are getting drastically more of retirees. One solution, shift from retirement to re-engagement. In the past, you retire, live five more years and die. Now chances are good you'll be around for a good 10, 20, 30 years after you retire and be needing some supplemental income too. You just don't necessarily want to do the same thing or work as hard. We have, we have hundreds of thousands of people, for example, who work their whole lives in advertising, marketing or corporate sales, and who want to continue to use their skills, but don't want to re-enter the old profession. Let's attract some of them to become part of the transforming healthcare system. Part time. No problem. Work from home? Consider it done. You can be a retired or newly trained nurse and answer questions from your home on a computer on your own schedule. Just as JetBlue Reservation Team and Agents does today. You can see where the shift is heading. More and more of actual application of healthcare is going to be put in the hands of the patients. Or the or to put it another way, every citizen will become a part of the healthcare delivery system. Diabetics already know how to self-diagnose and self-administer, depending on the medication. Why not apply that model to everyone? In fact, we've already been heading in this direction for decades. In the 1950s and the 1960s, patients wanted their wise, kindly old family doctors Tell them what to do. Today people look up their own conditions on the internet and often know more about the latest treatments than their doctors do. The three digital accelerators and eight transformation pathways will accelerate that trend beyond anyone's imagination. The problem is that cutting edge technology finds its way into the healthcare world rapidly when it comes to the actual treatment of disease but very slowly in relation to the management of our hospitals and healthcare systems. There is a huge gap between the technological state of our healthcare diagnostic and treatment techniques and our healthcare management systems, including the supply chain, delivery systems, and every aspect of the experience right up through 
billing and insurance. In this, the modern hospital is in a situation very similar to that of the big four, recording labels and big three automakers. Doctors are working on the cutting edge when they enter the operating room, but they are working with in an environment organized and administered by systems that feel as if they were created in the dark ages. In the same way, there are extremely advanced engineering and prototyping systems inside GM, but that couldn't save them from collapse because the over organizational process and overall thinking there was still reactive and past focused. When you go to place an order on Amazon, they already have your credit card and all your shipping addresses from past orders. Imagine if we had the same experience at hospitals. And when you ship a package via FedEx anywhere in the world, you can go online and see exactly where your package is at any time. If we can do this for the package, couldn't we do it with a patient? American Healthcare still has a Byzantine approach patient information. When you go to see your doctor, what's the first thing that happens? You fill in a form, and then you wait, and then you wait some more. It doesn't matter when your appointment time is. You never actually see your doctor then. Why not? Why can't you submit all that information online the evening before? Why can't your doctor's office know who you are, what your history is, and why you're there to see them? the moment you walk in the door. When I call my airline frequent flyer, the answer the phone by saying, hello, mister, before I even open my mouth, they know who I am because they have a smart data system network with their smartphone system and it tells them who I am. Why can they do that at my doctor's office? They could, they just haven't. Still, as behind the curve as they are, even our entrenched healthcare institutions cannot withstand the onrush of technological metamorphosis bearing down upon us. To the extent that our existing institutions fail to budge, we will see independent initiatives leapfrog over the calcified geriatric systems presently in place to bring innovation to the marketplace. In Canada, the healthcare system is working furiously to integrate all patient records into one central database. As of 2010, only 20% of the US patient population have computerized records, a number that will escalate rapidly. Imagine this scenario. Walking down the street, you come up on the scene of an accident. A man is lying on the street unconscious. You flip open your cell phone, place his finger on it, or do a retinal scan, or one of any number of other biometrics, and within seconds, your phone identifies him. Before you get any information, you place your finger on the phone too, and the medical information bank recognizes you. Because you are not a doctor or nurse, you don't get access to the man's full medical records. However, the system notices that you take a course in CPR. So if that's indicated, it tells you, or it sees that you didn't, so walks you through that process with streaming video right on the phone. What's preventing these things from happening today? Only one thing, how we manage our health information. Our digital accelerators are creating an astonishing opportunity to transform how we do this. Increasing storage means we can maintain all our records. Increasing processing power means we can interface and collate them, along with all known medical data, seamlessly and instantly. And mine, them for actionable low knowledge. And increasingly bandwidth means we can take this process virtual, with wireless access anywhere, anytime, along with full high def video conferencing from professional interpretation when necessary. Health information is a gigantic business and those companies that grasp the scope of the transformation ahead will be the ones that will affect this shift. Early pioneers such as iMedics, WebMD and Revolution Health have already taken this leap 
and those who do the best jobs seizing the high ground will do enormously well for themselves in the process, just as Apple did with the iPod and the iPhone. Welcome to the new web. We've been exploring the future of energy, agriculture and healthcare as examples of how every aspect of our world will be transformed as the curve of digital technologies advancement goes vertical. We could choose any one of a thousand other areas. Since this metamorphic wave, we leave nothing untouched. But no, discussion of the coming transformation would be complete without a tour of the environment in which we have to spend more and more of our time, the web, the internet, social media, web pages, applications. To date, the web has gone through two basic iterations. The first generation, lasting through the end of the 90s, presented the web as a flat, one-dimensional way of displaying information that could be accessed by keyboard searches. Basically, it was humans interacting with computers, which would soon change. Google's current project to digitalize all the world's book and make their contents available via search is an advanced form of Web 1.0, which is currently on place right now. You can find almost any book in Google Books. Download them, download certain parts of it or buy the whole book. It's a great, great tool. The web second iteration has been characterized by the use to user to user dimension of content sharing. Peer-to-peer -peer networking was application used, for example, by Napster to offer music file sharing to the masses. Since then we have seen enthusiastic amateurs from around the world work together to classify and post massive amounts of new content on the collective encyclopedia project Wikipedia. Idea sharing tools, blogs, and social media, personality sharing sites like Instagram, Facebook, photo sharing like Flickr, video sharing sites like this one, are all examples of the content sharing nature of web 2.0, which has given rise to the concept of social networking, social web. Thanks to the underlying technology of XML, which allows machines to talk to other machines over the web, apps as well as individuals can also share data with each other. For example, the connecting of corporate or personal location-based data to Google Maps. Web 2.0 created an entirely new experience, but that's all now behind us. Web 2.0 is already all news. The future is Web 3.0 and plus. The hallmark of Web 3.0 is that an immersive environment. In this new internet construct, you won't use the web, you will enter the web. For the essence of the early internet experience was information search and retrieval and Web 2.0 was all about interaction and communication. The prime thrust of Web 3.0 will be immersion and multidimensional experience. Today we talk about going onto the web to look for information. In the future, that language will change. Instead, we will speak about going into the web to learn and interact. Since the year 2000, I have been giving small demonstrations of an early prototype 3D web browser in several keynotes, showing audiences that it would be like to step into an inner special immersive environment to shop and get customer service. As you clock on, click on this site, you have the sensation of stepping into a room where you are surrounded by content of different types on all sides. Turn on 
turn to the right and there on the wall is your live newsroom whatever your favorite news sites and sources are they they are all open simultaneously now look to your left and there are the most current projects you're working on look behind itineraries for your next trip banking account information investments other information you like to have nearby in the version I use it feels like you are moving through a virtual environment we can enter a building hop into an elevator go up a floor and see a whole different room in this case a shopping mall that looks and acts just like a brick and mortar mall we walk down the hall and on the left there's a Porsche dealer wait you say car dealers don't have display rooms in malls maybe not in physical malls or in virtual malls why not walk up to your grade model and you can open the door and explore the interior in high definition open the globe compartment check out the back seat to see how roomy it is you can open the trunk and throw in some golf clubs and see how they fit in fact you can start it see how it sounds perhaps even take it for a virtual spin the applications of such an experience and experiences will be transformational not only in and of themselves but also as combined with their real world counterparts right now let's say you and I attend a big trade show on the latest technologies for your industry whatever it may be all the biggest suppliers from around the world are there showing off their latest greatest new stuff even though we're there for several days dawn to dusk there's no way we can get to all those booths and see all those displays I've been to trade shows that feature entire city blocks worth of the latest technologies how do you take it all in? It's impossible. So let's make that possible. When the conference is over, everyone packs up and goes home. What if instead we just clone the entire event to 3D virtual? The CAD computer aided design drawings of the building already on file can instantly recreate the entire conference center in 3D form, needing only graphic artists to get the colors right. Let the vendors and their virtual products and presto, you have your fully immersive trade show. We are now used to that with virtual trade, job fairs, car, etc. Now, when we go home, everything is still there. It's never over. You can click on and every booth and connect to a real salesperson via video conference anytime you like and by the way the vendors are still paying a fee albeit a fraction of in-person cost now instead of having a 3 day conference you have a 12 month conference just a bright and powerful idea in most of these 3G environments we use it will seem that you are actually there looking out into the room, etc. In others, you will watch yourself walking through the room. Although, of course, it won't actually be you who walks through these 3D environments, but a special size of avatar that is an online representative of you in the virtual environment. An early version of this experience can be found in this sound thing, Linden's Lab Second Life where several million registered players select an avatar of themselves through which they can interact with others, purchase land, build homes, conduct business. Another is enormously popular avatar-based video games such as World of Warcraft. Because of runway multiplication of the three digital accelerators over the next several years, we will still see this kind of dimensional experience come to the web for the general user. 
Welcome to Web 4.0 Plus Ultra Intelligent Electronic Agents. The Web 3.0 is right now, and what's beyond that? Web 4.0 further interaction of the online experience that will transform how we do everything. The essence of Web 4.0 is this instead of our having to go searching for what we want. It will come to us. Advances in AI have created a type of intelligent search that tailors itself to the individual user, learning our parameters and preferences to make our searches automatically more relevant and useful to each of us individually. Soon we will be using a powerful new tool to do a good deal of our web-based work for us. Thanks to an emerging technology called ultra-intelligent electronic agents. Because they reside on the internet, you can access your e-agents from anywhere, regardless of where you are or what device you are using. We will probably use them at first through laptops and PCs, and then maybe apps. But they will leap to our phones in no time soon, they are already there. Only you will have access to your personal e-agent. You will use two forms of identification, like your voice or face, or fingerprint to identify yourself. You will be able to select various types of plugin agent functionality. For example, your financial planner may offer an agent plug in model to help you manage your money. Your travel agent, if you still have one, may offer a plugin giving your highly customized and unique travel advice. Your trainer from the gym may offer a virtual trainer plugin to be with you on the road. The list of possible plugins is endless. Professional plug psychologists will provide plugin models for patients to help guide them through tough situations. Career counselors will provide plugin models to help you think through career changes giving your guidance as you make career path decisions and linking you to the best resources. You will most likely have one main e-agent to interface with most often, but you will have others that help you both at home and at work, like for example this new Microsoft Copilot thing, which is an organizational e-agent will execute tasks on behalf of a business process. Personal e-agents will carry out tasks on behalf of one user. In time, businesses and individuals will delegate basic responsibilities to a customized collection of highly intelligent e-agents. Getting to know you. Your e-agent will use neural network technology to learn more about your entire time you use it. This is the function. For example, that allows Amazon to build a profile of your preferences by keeping track of your searches and purchases, and how it is able to make personally relevant recommendations. The more time you spend on Amazon, the better it gets to know you, and the better its recommendations become. Apple's iTunes has a similar function called Genius that will recommend music, movies, TV shows based on your preferences and even create playlists and mixes for you with a single click. Your ultra intelligent e agents will take this functionality to a whole new level. Imagine sitting down in front of your TV or your gadget turning it on and since it is connected to the web your e-agent pops up and asks what you're in the mood to watch let's say you want an adventure movie that you have never seen before the agent will suggest a particular movie if possible it will suggest a movie that has a favorite actors and director and a plot that has tweets and turns the way you like it best this already is happening or if you want something fresh and different, a complete change from style of your usual choices, then your e-agent will fill that bill just as easily. 
Before showing you the movie, your e agent might say, I know you have been wanting to buy a sailboat. I have found several that fit your specifications. Would you like to look at the boats and have me review the materials now or later? Your e agent will monitor your complete health and wellness, reminding you to take your medicine, warning you of potential allergic reactions, helping you with your diet, exercise, and guiding you through optimum day to day. Who would be in the best position to supply this health e agent plugin model? The person you trust with your life, your doctor. As the world continues to get more complex and as we have access to increasing amounts of information, we will turn to our most trust professionals for the guidance and help. Trust will be even more important in the future than it was in the past, and those professionals will increasingly turn to highly intelligent e-agents to help them in their tasks. For many, the e-agent will become a friend listening to and helping to solve minor problems, responding sympathetically and suggesting helpful resources. They will be a great listeners and will respond only when a response is needed and with the kind of response that you have found most helpful over time. What would your e-agent will look like? You will determine what your e-agent will look like the voice it will have, and you will even be able to give it a personality. Most of us will rent a public personality to be our e-agent. For example, if you want a little homer in your personal e-agent, you may pay a few pennies to rent the likeness and personality of whoever the hot new comic actor is. Some might prefer an action star or pop star. This will create an entire new revenue stream for public personalities. That means there will be a wide variety of e agents from which to choose. Disney and Pixar could make their most popular cartoon characters available as intelligent e agents, mentors, and coaches for children. Your child will select his or her cartoon e agent. As a mentor, the e agent may say to the child who has been using the computer for too long time, Hold it, you've been looking at this screen way too long. Time to do something else in the real world, like going outside and playing with some friends. As a coach, the tune e agent could test the child on spelling, punctuation, grammar, math, history in a completely entertaining way. Of course, it will also perform functions like reminding them of appointments with friends to practice their music lesson or to finish their homework. A personal concierge desk. Think of your e agent as a personal concierge desk. Wherever you might benefit from a human agent, mentor or coach, you will begin to find electronic versions that will serve as virtual assistants of those human advisors helping you stay on track. You'll wake up in the morning and your e agent will greet you as you access your net-enabled TV, computer, phone, or whatever device you're using. It might say, I see from your calendar you are flying to Seattle this afternoon. It will be raining, so don't forget your umbrella or coat. The flight you were taking is having a mechanical delay, so I rebooked you on another flight. Last night, the stock you were interested in hit the price point you wanted. And after accessing all of the best analysts reports, I felt confident in purchasing 200 shares per your request. Don't forget this is your day of exercising. It's like an AI chat GPT, but with concierge abilities. Your e agent will also serve as a personal researcher and organizer. You will have to go to Google, Wikipedia, or any information sites. If you don't want to, just tell your e agent or Alexa that you need, and it will go for it for search. And a lot faster than you'll be able to do it. And the more you use it, the better it will know you, see your preferences, and exactly what is you're looking for. Since the web will go with you wirelessly, however you go, your e-agent will always be there. 
when you want or need help. Your agent will let you know the minute you have a new email or voice mail and ask if you want it now or later. And it will do a much better job of filtering all of your junk email than today's spam filters. It will inform you of traffic delays as you drive and offer alternative routes. Thanks to the growth of smart parking, as you enter the airport, your e-agent will tell you how to get to the closest parking space available. Imagine you're on a vacation with your family. You've been driving for hours and you're all getting hungry. Since your car knows your exact location, direction and destination, and since the car will be web-enabled, all you have to do is speak your e-agent's name and tell it that you are hungry. The e-agent will ask our each passenger what they would like to eat and when. Based on the answers, it will access all the electronic menus of each restaurant within a 10 mile forward radius of car's position. Many restaurants already post their menus and daily specials on the web because it brings in more business. The e-agent will recommend where to go based on your food preferences and budget limitations and then provide driving directions to the restaurant. Sometimes when I talk about such developments, people say, that sounds terrible, a world where everyone interacts with machines and artificial intelligence, and nobody talks to each other anymore. But in fact, it's quite the opposite. The more high tech we become, the more high touch we'll need. A whole generation of adults worry that the rise of more and more realistic video games would mean their kids would become a social, reclusive, automatons incapable of meaning relationships or social sensibilities but from all the evidence the kids of generation G Y are just the opposite they are more socially conscious more concerned about the environment and other large-scale social issues more creative and entrepreneurial than any previous generation in fact, as we transform into a vastly more highly tech society, we will see our world become more human, not less. There is a simple reason for this, and it goes to a crucial flesh foresight principle that governs how all this digital transformation will actually play out in the real world. The both and principle. When it comes to technology driving change, think both and. In the late 80s, many futurists began predicting that by the late 90s, our offices would be paperless. We are still waiting. When the late 90s arrived, experts started predicting that within years we would have no more shopping malls. The malls are still with us. The same experts predicted that the phenomenal success of Amazon presaged the end of those brick and mortar dinosaurs, the Barnes and Noble superstores. After all, how can a physical store survive with its mere 100,000 titles when shoppers can go online and have instant access to million titles and more? And yet those stores survived and thrived. Why? Because you can walk into an Amazon and sit on a couch and have a latte while you browse a few magazines and visit with other book lovers. Executives, manager, and the business and popular press all tend to make the same false assumption about the future of technological change. Every time a new product category is introduced, they assume that the older category will soon vanish. But that's not the way it works. The hottest new breakthrough technologies do not necessarily replace older ones. Instead, they often coexist with them, side by side. Why? Because the old technology has its own unique profile of functional strengths, which the new technology never fully replaces. In the case of paper, it's inexpensive, portable, foldable. You can erase on it, and the best of all, it doesn't disappear if the computer goes down. Digital obviously has its powerful strengths as well. Both are here to stay. We tend to grant innovation with an either or assumption, but that is not an either or world, but both and world, a world of paper and paperless, online and in person, digital and analog, old media and new media, 
A few years ago, there was a big debate in the business press. Will the computer become a thin client, a device that stores all its data on and access all its software from a server, or will it continue to be a self-sufficient device that holds its own software? Which will it be? The answer is both and. The question is not which will survive, but which are the best devices for which application and situation. For schools, a thin client is perfect. All the kids need is their lightweight device, and they can access all their assignments, homework in progress, and reference tools on servers, whether they're at school or at home. And if they lose it or break it, the replacement cost is much lower. When it comes to business users, on the other hand, many of us might prefer having our Apple Store data right on our laptops or phones, so we are not dependent on our wireless connection. Either or thinking assumes a zero-sum game, in which the pie of is of a fixed size, and emerging technologies or emerging markets most necessarily threaten the existence of the old. But that's not the reality. For example, book publishers have been in a panic because of the suddenly booming popularity of ebooks. But the growth of digital books doesn't mean paper-based books will vanish. In 2000, marketing guru Seth Godin wrote a book called Unleashing the Idea Barrels and decided to do something very unconventional with it. He gave it away for free on the internet, not just a scissor of free chapter, but the entire book. In just the first three months, the ebook version was downloaded more than a million times, making it then the most popular ebook of all time. Publishers thought he was crazy, convinced this would cannibalize sales of the physical book. After all, the hardcover edition cost 40. Who would shell out 40 bucks when they could get the entire thing online for free? But Godin understood that it's both and world. When the hardcover came out, it flew off the shelves and became a bestseller itself. People who got the digital version in their PCs or mobiles wanted to have a paper copy they could have highlight right on holding their hands and put on their bookshelves. This is not to say that volume and market share for the older technology will always remain unchanged. Obviously there will be additional slices taken out of a pie, some smaller, some larger. But the both and integration of new tech and old tech combinations has an amazing way of enlarging the pie itself. And that is a crucial point here, integration. This is why all those paperless office predictions were off the mark. As we create new technologies, we also keep integrating old ones. Go into Barnes & Noble retail store and you can find an electronic kiosk for ordering any book online that is in stock on the store shelves. People go online to look at Apple products or Lexus automobiles, and some will even buy them there, but many of them go in person to the Apple store or Lexus dealer to touch the product, feel it, see it, how it works, and establish an in-person service relationship before they buy. Today, the nation newspapers look like publishers. They are, they are in panic, convinced that web-based media have made them obsolete. The radio and television networks are in the same state. But the old doesn't necessarily disappear. The secret to survival and new growth for these old tech organizations is to embrace the new tech and find creative ways to integrate the two. If a newspaper print version is different from its online version, then having both is a viable option. Grasping the secret of both and interoration can unleash dramatic new levels of resources, capacities, wealth, and capabilities. Returning to our discussion of Web 4.0 and the world of ultra-intelligent agents, the both and principle tells us that no matter how sophisticated and useful e-agents become, they will never replace live interaction with another person. Those businesses that mostly skillfully integrate electronic agents 
with real-time leap help, will be the ones that ultimately thrive and dominate their markets. Actually, you have probably already seen this play out on sim simpler platform, the infamous touch tone help menu. To review your account, press 1. To change or update your account, press 2. We'll, at some point, have the infuriating experience of trying to get something fairly simple done over the phone, only to find ourselves in a seemingly endless loop of menu choices, none of which quite get us to where we want to go. The companies that learn to adapt this new technology and integrate it seamlessly with exceptional good lib operator customer service and make that choice easily and transparently available at any time during the experience are the ones that excel, survive and thrive. The future is not automated help, it is automated help and lib help. The future is not digital fiber optic automated, self-serve, and youth-focused. It's digital and analog, fiber optic and copper, automated and manual, self-serve and full-serve, youth and elders. The faster things change, the more we will live in a both and world. And one flash, flash foresight key to surviving, succeeding, and thriving in that world is to continually seek ways to integrate the freshly old with the merging new.